So today we're looking at the Vipassana practice. <coughs> and we saw there that at the foundation level, um, we work on these three insights of impermanence, suffering and no self. And that here in the Mahayana Buddhist traditions, then in addition to that we go to a deeper level. And that is this wisdom of emptiness that we're just starting to discuss. <coughs> because here in the Mahayana traditions, it's asserted that it's not just that we have this false grasping onto me, but also how we see the world is a problem. Because there seems to be an independent objective world out there. But the assertion here, based on these perfection of wisdom teachings of the Buddha, is that if we investigate, we'll come to realize this. There's no independent objective world there. There's no independent subjective me here. And so that's what we um, started to explain just before the break. That we'll come to see that things are not independently existent, or in other words, things are empty of inherent existence, meaning they do not exist from their own side. They do not exist independently because they dependently exist. And the technical word there is dependent arising. Things coming, to, coming into existence dependently. And we saw before the break that um, the first way in which things are dependent, they come into existence dependently, is they exist depending on causes and conditions. And then we looked at the second way in which things come into existence dependently, is they depend on their parts. And so now let's look at the third way in which things uh, exist dependently. is that things exist dependently in, de in dependence on uh, labelling, conception, designation. So all these three words mean the same thing. So if you understand one of those words, you understand all three. And when we look at that, uh, we, we often think, oh, I know what that means. There's a thing here, and we're calling it a laptop. Again, that's quite a superficial understanding. So to understand that at the deepest level, what we can appreciate is that when we look out on the world, we're receiving a mass of sense data, particularly visual data. And to make sense or meaning out of all of this stuff, what we do is we draw lines around various collections of data and we create meaningful objects make sense out of all of this. But we do more than this because we, live, we don't live in isolation. Uh, and so in order to be able to communicate with other people, then we, in addition to drawing lines and creating meaningful objects, we give names to those objects we've created so we can communicate with other people. So that's what labeling conception designation means. It's this process of drawing lines, creating objects, and then giving them a name. How we do this is not fixed, it's completely arbitrary, depending on the meaning that we want to get out of what we perceive. For example, how many things are here? How many things are there? Most often, uh, probably we draw just one line around all of that data, create one object and call it a star. Probably most meaningful in most situations. But on other occasions it may be more meaningful to draw two lines, to create two objects and say there's two triangles there. On other occasions it may be more meaningful to draw six lines, create six objects and say there's six triangles. Another occasion to draw seven lines, say there's six triangles and a hexagon. And on another occasion it may be more meaningful to say there's a collection of 18 lines there. So is there one, two, six, seven, or eighteen objects there? How many things are there? We decide. We decide how many things are there. Meaning, 
there is no star existing there independent of our conceptual framework. The only star that exists is the one that we created in our conceptual mind. There is no star to be found there. So therefore we have two terms used here. <coughs> the first term we see is that things are merely labelled. Merely means just, only labelled. Meaning things only exist within our conceptual framework. The only star that exists is the one that we created in our conceptual mind. There is no star to be found there from its own side, independent of the conceptual framework. That's merely labelled. Another term that often we find here is that things are not findable. Meaning, you cannot find a star here in the basis. Because the only star that exists is the one that we created in our conceptual mind. So that's what not findable means. Not findable means, it doesn't mean we can't find a cup on the table here. Not findable means there's no cup to be found in the basis. Because the only cup that exists is the one in our conceptual mind. And we are continually improving our ability to draw lines, to, to create better and better meaning in our life. And we know this well if we go into a new situation and we see a new situation that is completely unfamiliar to us. We look and we go, what's that? Because we don't know how to draw the lines. Is that one thing? Is it a collection? Is it two? Is it What's that? We have no idea because it's some com completely familiar, unfamiliar collection of, of, of sense data. So we're struggling to draw lines to create some meaning. And then we, we try to do that. And we're continually improving our ability to do that. And so therefore, this is what the third point means. That things exist through labelling, conception, designation. Means they only exist within our conceptual framework. That things do not exist from their own side, independent of that conceptual framework. So based on this understanding, let's go back and have a look at these two, causes and conditions and parts, and try to understand them at a deeper level. So this is a timeline, this is a seed, and this is the plant that it produces. So we say the plant exists depending on causes and conditions. The underlying cause was the seed, the conditions are the soil, sunlight, water and so forth. Now we believe exi things exist independently. If that's the case, then there should be a fixed, obvious point where the seed becomes the plant. So at what point here does the seed become the plant? At what point? Here? There? At what point does the seed become the plant? Because we believe things exist independently of us. If that's really true, it should be a fixed, obvious point where the seed becomes the plant. Where is that? So what we understand is when we look at that, the point at where the seed becomes the plant is the point at which where this configuration of data stops looking like our concept of seed and starts looking like our concept of plant. And we all have slightly different concept of what it means to be a seed and a plant. So for some of us, it's already here. For some of us, it's here. For some of us, it's here. Maybe some of us, it's up here. We decide 
when the seed becomes the plant. Another point. If two things are in a, a causal relationship, then by definition, they cannot exist at the same time. Yeah. If, they, if two things are in a cause and effect relationship, by definition, they cannot exist at the same time. If they do, they're not in a causal relationship, by definition. Here's the question. Does the seed stop existing before the plant comes into existence? So think about it. Does the seed stop existing before the plant comes into existence? Yes or no? Which is it? No, no. no means they're existing at the same time. Illogical. No is an illogical answer. It cannot be no, because it would imply they exist at the same time and they're in a cause and effect relationship, so no is illogical. So if we say yes, the seed has ceased to exist, where is the plant coming from? Yes is illogical. Both no and yes are illogical. Why? Because if we believe in things existing independently, then common sense ideas like causality are impossible. They cannot work. Impossible. But and so, Nagarjuna in his text has 27 chapters of these sorts of arguments. He says, you believe in independent existence? What about causality? How does that work? Fire and fuel, agent and action. How do these things work? And we go, oh, yeah, you're right. It's, it, they, they, they become illogical. And so he uses these sorts of arguments to undermine the fact that things do not exist independently. But... Part of the skills of the seed is that it's a plant, like a potential plant. Potential, right? You can say that. It's okay. So we can I mean, label that a potential plant. That's fine. So they, but it's not a plant. It's a potential plant. Right. Yeah, that's okay. No problem. But it's a plant. I mean, no, it's a not a plant. plant. It's a plant. <laughs> no, but then you'd say, then you'd say, but then you couldn't have a causal relationship. Okay. But a plant a is a plant. There's nothing to do. If a plant is a plant, there's no causality. If this is a plant then there's no causality, because it's already a plant. Then there's no causality. But it's, it's a plant that didn't appear yet. It's, I mean, it's a potential plant. Yeah. Okay, so it's a seed. That's fine. But you can't say it's a plant. If you say it's a plant, then there's no causality. What's plant producing plant? Doesn't make any sense. So for Buddhism, plant is only a plant when you can see it. No, when you call it a plant. Right. <laughs> so it's a decision then. Correct. Same as causality. Exactly this is the point. Exactly. Causality. Isn't causality cause and effect? Isn't that a theory or concept that we've developed to make sense of this? Isn't it? So, therefore, what we do is if we believe things exist independently, then a little bit like the idea of impermanence, what we do is we... We, we turn things into discrete things. I mean, actually, if we just look at the, wor at the world level, at the physical world level, and science has proven this, isn't there just flow? Isn't there just flow? <coughs> science has proven it, yeah? At the physical world level, there's just flow. Constant change, isn't there? And in that constant flow, to make sense of that, don't we create ideas like seed and plant and causality to make sense of the flow? Good. The problem is we don't realise that's what we're doing. We believe there's seeds there, plants there, all that existing independent of these ideas that we've created. And we turn these, this flow, what we've done is we turn the flow into chunks. Mm. Then nothing works. It's in, it, it can't work. Because we've broken up this continuous flow into discrete things. And this is impossible then. Things can't work. Um, I'm struggling to see when you say that we consider causality to mean two things can't exist at once. Well, that's the concept we developed. That's what causality means. That is the concept of causality. <coughs> yeah, I, I can't see it. Well, then it's not causality. I mean, causality... <coughs> The concept causality, that concept, part of that concept is the fact that things don't, can't exist. If they're in a causal relationship, they can't exist at the same time. That is part of the idea of the concept of causality that we create. So you mean there's like time one and time two? 
Yeah. And like that affects causality is, is in terms of something transforming into something else. That's what causality means. That's the that's what And what's Buddhism saying that they're the same time? No, it's saying that causality is, is a concept. It's good, it's meaningful, it's helpful. But the problem is if we then have causality on the basis of believing that things exist independently, then there's a problem. Then it, nothing can work because it, we've, 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 we've out, out of sync with reality. That if we, if we correctly understand this just flow, and within that flow we create things like seeds and plants and we create an idea of causality in our mind, then then we can make sense or meaning out of everything we experience. Great. But if we grasp onto those things as real, as there, independent of our framework, then there's a problem. Then nothing works anymore. Um, can you repeat the example of the seed? Of the seed of plant? In terms of causality? Yes. Yeah. Does the seed stop existing before the plant comes into existence? I mean, there can only be two answers, yes or no. Before the plant comes into existence. I mean, like you said, we define the entity when it comes into the seed. Exactly. So if we understand that seeds and plants only exist in conceptual framework, all we do is we just change our label. Then there's no problem. Mm -hmm. But if we believe they exist there independent of our conceptual framework, then there's a problem. Then things don't work anymore. Well, so what's the answer? Yes or no? Does the seed stop existing before the plant comes into existence? Yes. It does. So the seed has stopped to exist. Yes. Where's the plant coming from? No, no, it's, it's gone. The seed is not existing anymore. Where is the plant coming from? Can't work. From the seed. No, it's gone. It's not existing anymore. <laughs> Sorry? Well, then you're saying it does, it, it does still exist when the plant comes into it. Yeah, but again, there's only two answers, yes or no. Which is it? If you say yes, it means the seed has stopped existing. It's not there anymore. So where's the plant coming from? It, it can't come. Illogical. If you say no, it means they exist at the same time. That's also illogical. So what we're saying is that common sense ideas of causality based on the belief that things exist independently, it, it, it's illogical, it can't work. How, how do you make that leap from, from the, how does, how does the lack of existence, how do you jump from the lack of existence lack of questions to the flow? How does, how does everything being, being part of the same thing answer the question? Explain the, explain the, explain the, the, the flow. flow. Because there's no, because in flow there's no discrete moments. Because it's flow. That's why. But what we do is when we grasp onto things, we cut that continuous flow into discrete moments. Then there's a problem. Then things can't work. That's what we're saying. So, so on that point, um, we say that the plant exists depending on the seed, yeah? But this view is saying the seed exists depending on the plant as well. Why? And it's not because this plant produces more <coughs> seeds. Why does the seed depend on the plant to exist? It cannot grow into plant, not seed. In what sense? Hmm? No, no, that's not the answer. I mean, that's true, but it's not the answer to the question. It's relative to depending on the You can only call something a seed if you have the idea plan. You can only call something a cause if you have the idea result. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Whether or not it produces as plant is not, it doesn't not, not important. Is you can only call it a seed if you have the idea plan. Cause, the idea result. Let's go to parts now. 
So we say this pen exists depending on its parts. But can you find a pen here? Is that a pen? No. <laughs> is that a pen? No. Uh, is that a pen? No. Is the plastic tube a pen? No. Is the ink inside a pen? No. Is the ball on the end a pen? No. Is a piece of metal a pen? No. Where's the pen? Oh, that's easy. It's the collection of those things. Here's the collection. There we go. Oh, no, 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 no. In a certain shape. Okay. So you have to tell me when the pen comes into existence. <laughs> Don't miss it. Don't miss it. <laughs> Anyone? No, no one, no takers yet? There is pen. Closer, closer. Closer. What about that? I've got that. Closer. No, 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 no. So, when does the pen come into existence? Exactly. It comes into existence only when this configuration of data closely enough resembles our concept of pen. And concepts usually have at least two parts, appearance and functionality. So when this appears closely enough to our idea of pen, and it seems to function according to our idea of pen, then there's a pen. Not before. If the pen was to be found here, in the basis, independent of our conceptual framework, it would mean if a caveman walked in the door, they'd pick it up and start writing with it. But the, probably a caveman came in and think it's some sort of weapon to stab with. And then of course if a dog came in here, they'd probably see some sort of chewing stick to chew on. And if a tiny little ant came here, they may see some sort of home to live in. So is this a pen, a weapon, a chewing stick or a home? From its own side, none of those things. From the side of the observer, all of those things. We bring the pen into existence in our conceptual framework. So what we're saying here is the pen is merely labelled depending on the collection of parts. Verse, and what we, and so what we're saying is the pen is not the collection of the parts. So if we can understand that those two things are not, are saying, not the same thing, we're understanding something about emptiness. So the two statements are, is the pen is the collection of the parts versus the pen is merely labelled depending on the collection of the parts. If we can appreciate those two statements are not saying the same thing, we're beginning to understand something about emptiness. The pen is the collection of the parts versus the pen is merely labelled depending on the collection of the parts. And so what we can understand is we have a basis and then we have a label pen. And we're applying the label pen to the basis. That's what labeling means. Label, basis, apply. But what we do, and that's our, our language reinforces this, we say, this is a pen. This is a pen. So what that language does is it reinforces our old friend cognitive fusion. We are identifying the label with the basis. We are fusing the two together and saying this is a pen. When in fact there are two things here. There's a basis and the label pen. And they're associated of course and we're applying the label to the basis. But when we start saying things like this is a pen, that leads us to do the cognitive fusion. That the pen, that's a pen existing there independent of my, our conceptual framework. And in addition to that, what happens is if we do that, cognitive fusion, then the basis, of course, is constantly changing. 
the label pen is not really changing. So what happens is when we fuse the label to the basis, suddenly this becomes a static thing, a pen, that doesn't seem to change. Because pen doesn't really change. Maybe we adjust our concepts a little bit, but it's a pretty static thing. So therefore, yes, yes, this is, a, this is the same pen that was here yesterday, it'll be the same pen here tomorrow. So that also reinforces the grasping to things as being unchanging as well. And then you may ask, what's the problem with this? What's the problem with seeing the world as already divided up into many separate discrete things? What's the big problem with that? And of course the problem with that is this, the suffering and its causes. That if we believe that there is the world out there made up of many separate discrete things, then of course when we see something pleasant, that seems to be the source of my happiness, attachment, unpleasant, source of my suffering, aversion, and the whole mess starts from there. Now, We, yeah, we have to draw lines and give names. There's no problem there. If we don't do that, we couldn't function. In fact, I think a newborn baby can't even do that at a very primitive level. A newborn baby has to learn to start to draw lines. <coughs> the problem is we don't realise that's what we're doing. We don't realise we're line drawers. Because it seems like the world is already there, independent, separate discrete things already. So we don't realise we're like drawing lines and creating objects and giving names. And so we end up turning the lines into what's called boundaries. We believe that the world is full of boundaries, that the world is made up of many separate discrete things. And that's where the problem begins. Grasping on to independent me, independent world, the whole process begins there. Now, one of the great challenges with this is that we are stuck in what's called the two extremes. There's a question. Um, I was just wondering, like, I, mean, I understand what you mean by flow, that everything is changing, and I guess you can apply like, living bodies to that concept as well. But how do you then explain individual minds? Because that kind of seems to me that it's different chunks of minds incarnating into different And that's exactly what we're coming to now. <laughs> is one of the difficulties with this view is that we are stuck in what's called the two extremes. And the two extremes are existence and non-existence. I mean, generally we're stuck in this extreme now, meaning grasping onto everything existing independently. And of course, everything that we've ever experienced seems to exist independently. So for us now, there's only two options. Either things exist and are independent, or they don't exist at all. And so what we're doing here, of course, in this Vipassana practice of emptiness, is we are undermining this. We are coming to see and realise nothing exists independently. Through our understanding and experience of emptiness, we are overcoming this extreme of existence. But of course, for us now, there seems to be just two possibilities. Either there is a real independent world, a real independent me, or there's no me and no world. So what often happens is that when we start this practice of emptiness, and we're coming to really appreciate and realise 
there's no independent me, no independent world, we misinterpret that to mean there's no me and no world at all, because that seems like the only other option. So we end up falling to the extreme of nihilism. How we start to overcome that is by this reflecting on dependent arising. is to reflect on the fact things exist. I exist, the world exists. Through causes and conditions, parts, and existing within the conceptual framework. So if we can improve our understanding of this, then, through our emptiness practice, instead of falling to the extreme of nihilism, we'll find that middle way. And that's what this word majamika means, the middle way. The middle way between the two extremes. There's a third option, the middle way. And initially, as I said, when we enter into this emptiness practice, then we often have this idea that, well, if things are empty, they can't function, they don't even exist really. And if things function, they can't be empty. But that's a wrong understanding of emptiness. A measure that we have got a correct understanding of emptiness is because things are empty, they can function. And because things function, they must be empty. That's the correct view of emptiness. And this is very nicely summarised uh, by Nagarjuna in his text, this Mulamajamika Karika, he says, that which arises dependently and relatedly is explained as being empty. <coughs> and that which is empty is dependently designated. This is the middle way path. That is the middle way, is that understanding. Because things are empty, therefore things can function. And because things function, they must be empty. That's the middle way. That's the correct view of emptiness. And it's, it's not so easy to find that middle way. Because sometimes I hear people who claim to be Buddhists and who claim to have done a lot of uh, reflection and meditating on emptiness. But even much later then, years later, I hear them saying things like, Oh, it doesn't matter because everything's empty. I mean, this is completely the wrong understanding of emptiness. This is nihilism. What is the meaning of the word nihilism? Nihilism means nothing exists at all. So again, the correct understanding is because things are empty, they can function. And because things function, they must be empty. Because if this... If this was a pen from its own side, if it had a unique nature of being a pen, then it couldn't change, it couldn't function, you couldn't create it, you couldn't destroy it. But because it has no unique nature of being a pen from its own side, therefore it can change, you can create it, you can destroy it, it can function. That's the correct view of emptiness. Sorry, I'm really getting the last part. Yeah. <coughs> because it has no unique nature from its own side of being a pen, Therefore, you can create it, you can destroy it, it can function. Why? Because it's not a static thing. So you're saying that... It's a flow, in other words. If we want to use impermanence, because this is a flow and not a static thing being a pen, if it was a static thing being a pen, there'd be no flow. Because there's flow, it means that you can create, you can destroy, it can function. You can destroy it. Well, no, the pen can no, just get destroyed. Yeah, the pen can get destroyed. The pen can collapse and get destroyed. Right. No, because it's flow. So if we, that's why I find impermanence is very helpful for emptiness. If we really can appreciate impermanence, this idea of flow, we're very close to understanding emptiness. Very close. So if we can really start there, it would be very helpful. Just understanding this is flow. <coughs> Um, there was a question down the back before, I think, yeah. Um, so what about all the raw materials, like About the raw materials, yeah. Uh, uh, like oxygen and hydrogen. Sure. Uh, we don't 
<laughs> Did they? Um, oxygen is that one thing? Is it one thing? Oxygen? Hydrogen. Huh? It's air. Yeah, but I mean, it is like, well, we use the same thing about pen, you know. There's still a pen there, isn't there? Is it? Is there a pen there independent of our conceptual framework? No, so then we go down another level. Is this a cap by its own, or do, does a cap exist there independently of us, or we just, only, cap only exists in our conceptual framework? Yeah, so we keep going down, down, down. We get down to our atom. Is there an atom there independent of conceptual framework? Or is it simply a collection of subatomic particles that we've labelled atom? And what about a subatomic particle? We can keep going down, 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 there's no bottom. No bottom. So, um, when you talked about the link between realising emptiness and escaping suffering, yeah. is that because of the inner happiness thing? So you kind of realise... The only reason you ever see things as causing suffering is because you've conceptualised in that way. Well, not conceptualised, it's realise you didn't, you realise, you, you, you uh, don't realise you're conceptualising. You think that they're there, independent of your conceptions. That's the reason we suffer. It's like a simple example, you know, if we look at these flowers and we're having a pleasant experience, we correctly <coughs> say beautiful. No? That's valid. It's a concept, beautiful, based on our experience. But then somehow the beauty ends up being there. But the beauty is what we've created in our conceptual framework based on our experience. And so the problem is then if we see the beauty's there, then what happens is, oh, that's the source of my happiness, attachment. But if we realise experientially beauty in the eye of the beholder, I mean, that could never happen. We would just enjoy the beauty. Because it's not there, independent of our conceptual framework. It's all linked, like with impermanence as well. Well, the same thing, again, it's the yeah. same thing as with impermanence. I mean, that's why impermanence can be very helpful, because it can help us to really appreciate all these things. Um, about mathematics, like demonstration, um, you know, when you demonstrate something that is true, how, I don't know how to deal with that now, with science in general, things that have been, like, there is a demonstration in the conclusion is like, okay, you do that, 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 plus, 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 sure. plus, become true. Good. But it's just because we perceive it as true? Or Again, true I mean, mathematics is a human creation. We, we created mathematics to try and explain these complex processes. So we can and it's useful, it's very good. Yeah. But so, but here, the of true, then? well, here, see, there's true in, in two senses here. Mm -hmm. True as in, is it true that this is a cup? Yeah, sure. But, but is it true that there's causality? Yes. No, Buddhism's not arguing with that. But what we're, what we're talking about here is not what exists, but how things exist. So, in fact, in Chandrakirti, great Indian master, who, who wrote a text on this emptiness, he says, we don't argue with worldly people about what exists, because if we did, we'd, we'd lose. You know, we wouldn't argue with them saying, no, 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 no car, because there's a car. What we argue is, how does that cup exist? So, mathematics is great because it explains how thing, uh, what exists in the processes, but I don't think mathematics explains how things exist. It explains processes, gravity and all these sorts of things. It's great, wonderful, but we're talking about how things exist. And that's what we're looking at here. So Buddhism is not negating mathematics. In fact, mathematics is great. Right. So the question? <laughs> so the romanticized um, meaning of emptiness is the what? Sorry, the romanticized meaning. Romanticized. Of I mean, the popular meaning of uh, popular, the false. You mean? Sure. Is is realism? It's it's nothing, right? It's what? That it's nothing. Emptiness yeah. means like. If I walked into an empty room, there's nothing in it. Yeah, but remember, emptiness, when we hear the word emptiness, we have to ask, empty of what? We're not saying empty of existence. Yeah. Empty of independent existence. Mm 
So what would be a more appropriate word? It is a very good word. Because shunyata has come from shunya, mean is zero in Sanskrit. Zero. Zero as in hollow, meaning no essence. So actually it's a very good translation. A very good translation. And um, on that point um, is that... Hmm, I forgot now what I was going to say. Um, <coughs> <coughs> I slipped my mind now. So I wanted to add something there. Uh, it's gone. <laughs> Maybe come back. Uh, so when it comes to perception, independence, dependence, where is love fitting into this? It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> uh, everything is flow. Okay? Everything is flow. Physical, mental, yeah. Yeah, how come blood test? How? Blood test. <coughs> blood, blood test. Blood like, test. Blood, blood test. <laughs> yeah, and then? How, how can we rely on the results if, if it's like only um, a one moment in time? <laughs> and blood can change. <coughs> and it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Exactly. So but within that flow, Within that flow, we can see certain things are changing very quickly and some things are changing more slowly. So then we can rely on that. But usually we do one test and then... Uh, <laughs> 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 and it's changed, it, it's changed all the time. Yeah. It's just a psychological convenience. We think it's, it's reliable. Yeah. Many times it's not reliable. Uh, and they pretend to be like <laughs> That's true. That's true. So they can uh, earn more money. That's true. Okay. Um, just a couple more things and then some more questions. <laughs> First is, um, with this topic of emptiness, then, as we saw earlier with the Four Noble Truths and so forth, often when a, a new concept is introduced, we have a simple analogy to help us to better understand that. So with the Four Noble Truths, we have the physical illness analogy. And here with emptiness, there are many analogies that are used to help us to understand it a little bit more. The one that I particularly find useful is the analogy of a dream. And that is, when we're dreaming now, in the dream, there seems to be an independent dream me, and there seems to be an independent dream world out there. And then, of course, if we encounter something pleasant in the dream, we have attachment, craving, something unpleasant in the dream, maybe aversion, fear, anxiety, and so forth. But if in the middle of the dream, suddenly we realize we're dreaming, i.e. become lucid in the dream, then there'll still appear to be an independent me here, there'll still appear to be an independent dream world out there. But now, because we're lucid, we'll realize directly that these appearances are deceiving us. Which means that actually it would become very difficult to have any craving and attachment for anything pleasant that appears in the dream. And it would be very difficult to have any aversion, fear, or anxiety for anything unpleasant that appears in the dream. And we would enjoy the dream a hell of a lot more. Similarly, this view of emptiness is saying our waking life is like a dream. Because here, there seems to be an independent me, there seems to be an independent world out there. I encounter something pleasant, attachment, unpleasant, aversion, big mess. But if I become lucid in the waking state by realizing emptiness, there will still appear to be an independent me here, there will still appear to be an independent world out there, but because now I've realized emptiness, I will directly realize these appearances are deceiving me. I'll never, I won't buy into these appearances, which means it would become very difficult to have any craving and attachment for pleasant things, very difficult to have any aversion for unpleasant things, and we'd enjoy the waking life a hell of a lot more. So that's the analogy that um, uh, I find personally quite helpful. And regarding these two extremes as well, there's a presentation we often see um, here in this presentation on emptiness called the two truths. And that is um, conventional truth and ultimate truth. Sometimes this is translated as relative truth. 
And conventional truth, and these two truths are not sort of two different realities or anything. Conventional truth is simply everything that exists. And everything that exists is a dependent arising. And ultimate truth is how they exist. How, does it, how do all these uh, things that exist, how are they existing? And so ultimate truth is the fact that things are empty of independent existence. They're not inherently existent. So ultimate truth is emptiness. And on that point, uh, the two truths, I'd like to read, to expand on that a little bit, read from uh, a book I quoted from a bit earlier in the course, uh, What Makes You Not a Buddhist. Uh, and this is on page 66, he says the following. In Buddhist philosophy, anything that is perceived by the mind did not exist before the mind perceived it. It depends on the mind. It doesn't exist independently. Therefore, it doesn't truly exist. That is not to say that it doesn't exist somewhat. Buddhists call the perceived world relative truth, in other words, conventional truth, a truth that is measured and labelled by our ordinary minds. In order to qualify as ultimate truth, it must not be fabricated, it must not be a product of the imagination, and it must be independent of interpretation. <coughs> Although Siddhartha realised emptiness, <coughs> emptiness was not manufactured by Siddhartha or anyone else. Emptiness is not the result of his revelation, nor was it developed as a theory to help people be happy. Whether or not Siddhartha taught it, emptiness has always been emptiness. Although paradoxically we can't even really say that emptiness has always been, because it is beyond time and has no form. Nor should emptiness be interpreted as negation of existence. That is, we can't say that this relative world doesn't exist either. Because in order to negate something, you have to acknowledge that there is something to negate in the first place. Emptiness doesn't cancel out our daily experience. Siddhartha never said that something spectacular, better, purer or more divine exists in place of what we perceive. He wasn't an anarchist refuting the appearance or, or function of worldly existence either. He didn't say that there is no appearance of a rainbow or that there is no cup of tea. We can enjoy our experience, but just because we can experience something doesn't mean that it truly exists. Siddhartha simply suggested that we examine our experience and consider it could be just a temporary illusion, like a daydream. If someone asked you to flap your arms and fly, you would say, I can't, because in our experience of the relative world, it is not physically possible to fly. But suppose you are asleep and dreaming that you are, and, and dreaming that you are flying through the sky. If someone in the dream says human beings can't fly, you will say, yes, I can, see, and you will fly away. Siddhartha would agree on both counts. You can't fly when you're awake, and you can fly when you're asleep. The reasons are the causes and conditions that have or have not come together. A condition necessary to be able to fly is to be dreaming. When it is not there, you can't fly. When it is, you can. If you dream that you are flying and continue to believe that you can fly even after you wake up, that becomes a problem. You will fall and you will be disappointed. <laughs> Siddhartha says that even when we wake up in the relative world, we are asleep with ignorance. When the right causes and conditions come together, anything can appear. But when those conditions are exhausted, the appearance stops. Viewing our experience in this world as a dream, Siddhartha found that our habit of fixating on the mere appearance of our dreamlike relative world, thinking that it is truly existing, throws us into an endless cycle of pain and anxiety. We are in a deep sleep, hibernating like a silkworm in a cocoon. We have woven a reality based on our projections, imagination, hopes, fears and delusions. Our cocoons have become very solid and sophisticated. Our imaginings are so real to us that we are trapped in the cocoon. 
but we can free ourselves simply by realizing that this is all our imagination. There must be infinite ways to wake up from this sleep. Even substances like peyote and mescaline might give us a vague notion of the illusory aspect of reality. But a drug cannot provide total awakening, if only because this awakening is dependent on an external substance. And when the effect of the mescaline is gone, the experience is gone as well. Suppose that you are having a really bad dream. All it takes is a flicker of realization that you are dreaming to wake you up. The spark can come from within a dream. When you do something anomalous within a dream, you may be jostled into realizing that you are asleep. Peyote and mescaline can spark a short-lived realization by revealing the power of the mind and the imagination. Hallucinations help us temporarily recognize how tangible and believable illusions can be. But such substances are not advisable because they provide only an artificial experience. <coughs> One that can actually harm the body. Instead, we should have the aspiration to wake up once and for all, without depending on external input. We are much better off when realization comes from within. What we really need is to wake up from our habitual patterns, imagination and greed. Mind training and meditation are the swiftest, safest and most effective ways to work within the mind stream. As Siddhartha said, you are your own master. There's uh, the law of emptiness has independent existence. The law of emptiness has what, sorry? So, like we are learning about the emptiness. emptiness. We are what, sorry? We are learning about the emptiness. Emptiness, yeah. Does this has independent existence? No. <laughs> emptiness is not something floating in space. Emptiness only exists with respect to something. You can only have like emptiness of pen, emptiness of this, emptiness of that. <coughs> so actually, emptiness and phenomena or dependent arisings are two sides of a coin. It's not like there's emptiness there and then everything else is here. So emptiness and dependent arising are two sides of a coin. Emptiness exists relative to phenomena. It's a quality of all phenomena. It's how all phenomena exist. It's not some alternate reality we go to um, when we realize it. When you realize emptiness, what is that? Are you realizing? You're realizing <coughs> that, well, first, we, we're going to talk about this this afternoon. So let's say we are investigating me, the person, like a little bit we did this morning. We're looking for the me. And we don't seem to find the me. That not finding <coughs> is an experience of emptiness. <coughs> so the experience of emptiness is the not finding of an independent me. Technically, it's actually realizing that the me is not findable. So it's realizing that nothing exists. Independently, yes. So and the flip side of that is that when you come out of meditation, therefore you will realize everything is a dependent arising. Again, using the pen. If the pen existed from its own side as a pen, if it had a unique nature of being a pen, actually it couldn't change because it has a nature of being pen. Which means it couldn't function, you couldn't create it, you couldn't destroy it. But because it has no unique nature of being a pen from its own side, therefore it can change. It can become something different. You can create it, you can destroy it, it can function. Uh, is it something like in a philosophy lesson, lesson that is taught that ever does not exist? The what, sorry? The devil. Ever does not exist. The consciousness exists 
because the table exists. But there is no consciousness the table exists. Uh, <coughs> it is because it is. Can you, you have rephrase that in another way? I'm not sure what you mean. You have, you, mean. Conscious, you have this consciousness, so you create the table. If the ah, consciousness is okay. not there, the table is not there. Okay. Uh, in other words, you're saying like if the, the pen only exists because we, we, because we, we create it, yeah, in that sense. But again, we have to be careful when we see that, say that. Like the example of beauty. You know, we have an experience, we create beauty in our mind, but that doesn't mean we're hallucinating beauty. It doesn't mean we're sort of fabricating. Beauty is real. If the mind doesn't exist. Well, then there's nothing to talk about. If your mind doesn't exist, you can't say anything. No? <laughs> so that's an easy answer. So, when we say things like beauty is in the eye of the beholder, we have to understand that correctly. It doesn't mean I'm just sort of hallucinating beauty. I'm, I'm completely fabricating it. Beauty is real, but it's not there. It's in the interaction. It's in the experience that we label the experience that as beautiful based on experience. <coughs> so it's not there, and it's not hallucinating in the mind. It's a dependent phenomena. Beauty is dependent on the observer, the phenomena, and the experience. How an animal... Oh, I, mean, I think an animal sees... Animal the well, I'm sure they also, they have concepts. I mean, I think animals have concepts like food, danger, shelter. I mean, maybe more primitive than us, but they certainly have concepts. Because an if an animal didn't have concept at some primitive... They, they, they wouldn't know what to eat and what to run away from, would they? So, you know earlier when you said... When you leave the room, the laptop stops it work, like it's not... Well, the question is, who's leaving the room? That's the real question. <laughs> but if we're talking about... That's a bit much for me right now. If okay. we're talking about laptop, <laughs> um, are you saying that... So, we leave the room. Um, the physical parts of the laptop still exist, but the concept of a laptop... No, no it's not even. No. Okay. Um, that's the sort of the, the more simple version is that there's a thing, one thing here, and we're calling it a laptop. But we can go down, 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 down. Because every little, even the part is a concept which is then... Yeah, but again, that doesn't mean we're just hallucinating. Laptops function. Atoms function. Subatomic particles function. But they're not existing independently. And this is, the, like I said, this is it's not easy to find this little A here. I mean, so I said at the beginning, it'll take time. Um, let me do one more thing and then we can do some more questions. Um, so, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, what this labelling and conception and designation means is we are drawing lines, creating objects and giving names. And we have to do this, though, no problem here, because if we don't do this, we no sense or meaning, we couldn't function. The problem is, again, we don't realise this is what we're doing. We turn these lines we draw into boundaries. We're seeing the world as made up of, already is made up of many separate discrete things. And in most of our experiences, and this single experience, the first line we draw is we draw a line around here and we create the experiencer. Because this single experience and within single experience, there's two aspects. There's experiencer and experienced. And we have to distinguish those two things, otherwise no sense or meaning. And I think even a newborn baby has difficulty doing that. So we draw the line, we create experiencer, we give it label, me, I, whatever the label we want. But the problem is, of course, we don't realise that that's what we're doing. What we do is we immediately upon drawing the line and creating me, we, we turn that into a boundary. We grasp onto the me part of the experience and see ourselves as independent of what we experience. So that's what's called self-grasping. Grasping onto independent me. But that mind is completely illogical. That grasping to independent me. Um, and to understand that, we can ask the question, is this big? 
Is it big? It depends. Depends, exactly. You can't have big and small. Big only exists relative to small. Like that, up only exists relative to down, in relative to out. Just like that, me only rel exists relative to not me. Me, you, me, world, subject, object, experiencer, experienced. But grasping onto an independent me is exactly like saying this is big. It's completely illogical. It's completely illogical. And of course, that's what we do. We grasp onto the me, we split ourselves off from the experience and see ourselves as independent of what we experience. And then, of course, we're completely out of sync with the interdependent nature of reality. And if we're out of sync with the independent nature of reality, we're fighting against that and we struggle. And that's why we have mental afflictions and we suffer. And we often inflict suffering on others, of course, as well. And very often in our uh, behaviour, this self-grasping is quite strong. Me going there, me doing this, me saying that, me, 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 me with this sense that there's an independent me here. But sometimes in our behaviour, that self-grasping is a little bit less. Uh, for example, um, when we're absorbed in reading a good book, absorbed in watching an interesting program on TV, absorbed in solving a problem at work, on those occasions we're more focused on the activity rather than the agent who's doing the activity. So what you find is the grasping is less, and we know from our own experience in those situations, things seem to flow quite well, time seems to go quite quickly. Why? We're more in harmony with the interdependent nature of reality because the grasping is a little bit reduced. And that is even goes further for people who have developed high level of focus in their activities. For example, professional musicians, professional athletes who have spent thousands of hours of training in their activity and have developed a high level of focus in that activity. So much so that when they're doing that activity they often report that they get into the zone or the flow state. And not only do they often say in that state that there is actually no sense of me, there was just the music playing, just the activity happening, but also as well at that time they report peak performance, optimum performance. Why? Because we're much more in harmony with the interdependent nature of reality. But of course this is only due to increased focus, that temporarily the grasping is very much reduced. What we are doing here of course in Vipassana practice is we're taking that further, that we are actually cutting the self-grasping by realising there is no independent me. So if we do this Vipassana practice of emptiness and realise emptiness, we can cut this false grasping. We will realise, in fact, there's no independent me, no independent world. We'll realise, in fact, there's not one single boundary in the entire universe. And when we realise that, what you will find is when we come out of that experience, that we'll be able to develop boundless love and compassion for others. In fact, it will be quite automatic. Because now, we, with this grasping, there's a boundary. There's me here and them there, separate. Completely independent of me. Their suffering, well, that's their problem. If they're a friend, I might help, but otherwise, that's their problem, not my problem. But when we realise emptiness, we'll realise there's no boundary. What, which will, what will happen is that if suffering arises, whether it's in this body or that body, same. The automatic response is compassion. Whether this body or that body, same. So this is actually a sign that our emptiness practice is going in a good direction. <clears throat> is that if we're doing emptiness practice and we're having some sorts of experience, and we're doing it correctly, and it's a valid experience, what you should notice is in daily life that your mind will be a little bit more calm than normal, your mental afflictions will be weaker, less than normal, and you should find that you're feeling more close and connected and more kind and compassionate to others without thinking about it, just naturally. So that's a good sign that our emptiness practice is going in the right direction. Um, some questions there. 
Um, over here, then there. I still have that question with the mind, you know, like how, how do you explain that the mind's got a different body than other different bodies? Mm -hmm. So, right. <laughs> so, you can't have big on its own. You can't have big and small. Yeah? So, you have, so there's no independent big, no independent small. But are uh, big and small one? Are they one? One means identical. Is big and small one? No. But they're not two, meaning not big, not small. So realizing emptiness doesn't mean everything's one, which unfortunately sometimes people think. And sometimes we, people say that. Oh, emptiness means everything's one. Not true. One means identical, same. One is still trapped in duality. So, big and small are not one. One means identical. They're not identical, but they're not different. So, therefore, uh, in the text, when it talks about this fact that they're not different, uh, or what's called non-duality, Literally, it says not two. Things are not two, i.e. not different in that that's big and that's small. They exist, they're relative, and so there is big and there is small. They're not the same thing, but they're not independent. Similarly, my mind and your mind are not one, but they're not two different things. They're not two independent things for the same reason. They're distinct. Big and small are distinct, yeah? But they're not different, independent. If they're independent, that would be big, that would be small. So my mind and your mind are not one, but they're not independent. But they're, they're distinct. They're not one thing. Does that help? <laughs> yeah. So uh, the whole world is like an independent arising. A dependent arising, yeah. So the statement applied to everything. The what? That statement. A dependent arising, yeah, everything's a dependent arising. So yeah. the statement itself has independent existence. Sorry? The hmm. statement it's itself has what? independent existence. Has independent existence, no. Because you can only make the statement relative to you. You're making the statement. The statement can only exist relative to you, no? <laughs> Um, what is in life energy, and are there multiple life energies? Like if you're if you're not our mind, if you're not our body. Right. So I'm moving there now. So so far this morning we've been talking about laptops and pens and things, but where it really gets interesting is me. Yeah. And that's the topic for this afternoon. So I mean. So we're, we're sort of edging towards that. I exist only because you perceive me. So I exist in your perception. <laughs> Again, we have to. We can only talk with respect to ourselves, no? Right. So, with respect to me, you're another person. Right. But there's also different life energies, different consciousness, or there's one consciousness. So, is is big and small one? No. Is my mind and your mind one consciousness? But they're interdependent. Correct. Like this. So, again, the idea of collective consciousness is a dualistic notion. We're still stuck in duality. If we say everything's one or everything's a collective consciousness, these, all these terms are still stuck in duality. The two extremes you're talking about now? I can't hear, so I used to speak so up. The first view would be seeing the different things with boundaries. This one here, the, the exist, extreme of existence is, is yeah. Right. And the second one would be nothing. nothing exists at all. Yeah, so we have two views basically. Two extremes, they're, they're two extremes, two extreme views. So, 
So that's, that's exactly what I said, is that for us, now, there seems to be just two choices, two options. Either there is a real independent me in the independent world, or there's no me in no world. Right. Yeah, that's, that's the middle way. That's the middle way. That's the middle way. <laughs> the middle way is that there is a dependent me in a dependent world. That is the middle way. Good. No, it's not a spectrum. Well, well, no, because the two extremes don't exist at all. It's not they sort of, kind of exist. Yeah. It's not like so. It's sort of like the two extremes don't exist, and the middle way is what exists. Yeah. So spectrum. I, I don't know, I, for me it just seems a bit, it seems like there's, there's, it exists a lot, less, 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 less. It's just like, we're talking about it's existence. Like a circle, it's like a spectrum, it's a circle, 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 it's a circle. I'm not quite catching your... Like, you have maybe like a light spectrum, but it shows up in a circle. <laughs> I'm not, not, not really following what you're saying now with the spectrum. Is there like a visual way of uh, understanding it? A visual way? Yeah, like a, like a visual analogy. Well, a visual analogy is this. This is a visual analogy. <laughs> <laughs> but again, see, the thing is, as I mentioned at the beginning, this view of emptiness is saying that there's no duality. And the thing is, our conceptual mind is stuck in duality. And so anything we come up with that conceptual dualistic mind is, is at best, a, 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 vague, a rough approximation. At worst, it's completely misleading. Like, collective consciousness, everything's one. This is all completely misleading. So it's difficult. And, it, and of course, we won't be able to figure it out with our con conceptual mind. I mean, we can get an idea what it sort of implies, but then we have to experience. For example, if we meditate on emptiness and we had a valid experience of emptiness, and we came out of that, and someone said to us, please explain us emptiness, you'd go, uh, 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 it was sort of like, you, you couldn't use words, because it's, it's a non-dualistic experience. And our mind, our conceptual mind, is dualistic. So we're trying to use conceptual dualistic language to explain something that is completely not. So, again, therefore, analogies and things are very limited in what they can uh, help us. Uh, we need to stop there, so we'll continue these questions after lunch. Um, so let's do some discussion topics. The first question is, what does emptiness mean to you? <laughs> what does emptiness mean to you? Apart from confusion. <laughs> um, the second part of the first question is, is emptiness the same as things being interdependent? Is emptiness, is emptiness the same as things being interdependent? Second question is, how would an experience of emptiness, how would an experience of emptiness, how would an experience of emptiness affect our experience of eating a delicious piece of chocolate cake? <laughs> How would an experience of emptiness affect our experience of eating a delicious piece of chocolate cake? And the second part of that question is, 
How would an experience of emptiness affect our experience of meeting an irritating person at work? How would an experience of emptiness affect our experience of meeting an irritating person at work? How would our, an experience of emptiness affect our experience of meeting an irritating person at work? And the third question goes back to the topic from yesterday afternoon, is particularly this idea of self-cherishing, cherishing others. And the third question is, is it bad or wrong to want ourselves to be happy? Is it bad or wrong to want ourselves to be happy? And the second part of the third question is, how could we survive in the real world? How could we survive in the real world if we just cherished others? How could we survive in the real world if we just cherished others? So let's break there for lunch, um, and I'll see you back at 3.30.